in us. We're reminded in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, to trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge the Lord, and he shall direct our paths. As our children's church is being dismissed this morning, maybe that song spoke to you this morning and you just want to trust him and believe. Just, just lift those hands right now and tell him, Lord, I, I trust you. I, I believe you, God. I, I submit my will to your will. Father God, here I am. I trust you and I believe, Lord. I submit all and commit all and yield all I am to you today. And I just believe, Heavenly Father, that you have great things in store for those that trust you, Lord. Though it takes a mountain, a troubled sea, though it takes a, a valley, Lord God, a desert, Lord, we'll continue to trust you. We'll continue to believe in you. We'll continue to put confidence in you to know that you are our God and you cannot and you will not fail us. You're not a man that you should lie and you're not slack concerning your promises. Lord, I trust you and I believe you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's so good to us. I, I am thankful for all that he does. Later there in Romans chapter 8, he said there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. That does not mean that there will not be things that will not try to separate us or make us forget how much that he loves us and how much he cares for us. But he, he loves us with an everlasting love, and I'm thankful for that this morning. I'm thankful for the love of God, that he commended his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I, I just trust him this morning. How about you? No matter what storm you're going through, no matter what desert you may be facing right now, what mountain you may be climbing, just trust him. Just put your trust and your confidence in him, and I know that he will see you through. We're going to continue our uh, series on s being submitted this evening, into this evening's service. Uh, we started that last Sunday morning, and uh, my, my goal was this morning to continue that. Uh, but as I was praying this morning, uh, I just felt the Lord leading me to uh, switch my messages around today, what I was prepared to preach tonight, to preach this morning, and uh, to continue our series on submitting, being submitted and submission this evening. So turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 11. Ecclesiastes, chapter number 11. And we're going to read one verse there for a text today. Ecclesiastes, chapter 11. And I'm going to be reading one, one verse here um, from Solomon's writings. He said, Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Let's pray. Father, here we are trusting you this morning, God. Here we are submitted to your will and your way again today, Lord committed to your purpose for this service this morning, endeavoring to be obedient to every word that you speak into our hearts and our lives. Lord God, we come prepared today. We come ready to give an account, to stand and make a call, our calling and election sure. I stand in this pulpit now ready to be offered, Lord. I stand in this pulpit to, to be that mouthpiece speaking for you, God, needing that anointing to be upon me, Lord Jesus. Come prepared to deliver the word of God that you placed in my heart for this service this morning. And I pray, Lamb of God, that those in the pews have also made preparation for this service today, that we, through prayer and through fasting and through uh, studying of the word this week, have asked you to speak to us uh, in this service this morning. Uh, cultivating that ground and preparing that ground that it will receive the seed of your word. And I pray, God, with all of that being done, that the Holy Ghost of heaven will have your way in this service today. Draw us closer to you, that we won't leave here the same as we came, but we'll leave here drawn closer to your perfect will for our lives each day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Matthew Henry said this about this verse. He said, it must be your bread that which is honestly got. It's no charity but injury to give that which is none of our own to give. First to justly and then love mercy. Give freely as that which is cast upon the waters. Send it a voyage. Send it a venture as merchants that trade by sea. Trust it upon the waters, it shall not sink. Uh, he said there it would be uh, uh, no charity but injury to give that which is none of our own to give. 
first to justify it and then love mercy. Uh, but I read in another place that says this, we cannot give what we do not possess. You cannot impart into others that that you uh, do not have and that you not possess. Uh, so, so Matthew Henry here is telling us, uh, as they said this morning, uh, trust and believe. Uh, he said, trust it upon the waters. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it uh, after many days. Trust it upon the waters uh, and be assured of this. Uh, in, in the words of this great commentary, uh, he said this, it shall not sink. It shall not sink. So with that being said and using this verse as a text this morning, I, I want to preach to you a message entitled uh, to this morning, a message entitled, Coming Back Better Than Ever. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. And we, when we do that, we're going to have confidence to know uh, that it's coming back better than ever. Uh, coming back to us better than ever before. Uh, we've heard time and time again it's more blessed to give uh, than to receive. Uh, and the, the writer here is letting us know uh, that we need to take that that has been given to us uh, and give it freely. We need to be good stewards of what God has blessed us with, what God has placed in our care, and what God has, has given to us. Uh, uh, that's monetarily of course and that's uh, in every area of our life, not just monetarily uh, but in every Every gift and every blessing and everything uh, that God has given to us, uh, that we've got to be willing to give uh, freely. We've got to be willing to give of ourselves freely uh, and be able to say as these ladies were singing tonight whether it's a mountain, uh, whether it's a desert whether it's a troubled sea uh, whether it's on a mission field uh, whether it's in the streets, whether it's in the nursing home, uh, whether it's on the platform or in a Sunday school class uh, I'm willing to give of myself uh, freely unto the work of the Lord. Uh, I'm willing to put it all in uh, and give it all to the Lord. Uh, I'm willing to do what Romans 12, 1 and 2 uh, declares for me to do, to present my body a living sacrifice and what are we saying uh, Lord I'm yours Lord, I surrender. Uh, I surrender all of me to you. Uh, and if you'll do that, uh, he is letting us know here, uh, if we'll cast that bread upon the waters uh, and trust it upon the waters, it's not going to sink, church, uh, but it's going to come back. Uh, he said, thou shalt find it uh, after many days. Uh, understand when you give of yourself to the Lord and to the work of the Lord, uh, God's going to find a way to bring it back better than ever before. And I want to share with you a few examples of that from the Word of God. First being Moses. I'm working on a message on Moses. I'm looking forward to preaching it here in the next couple of weeks. But uh, I want to look here at another aspect of Moses' life, really uh, more of a faith and the trust of his mother. In Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we read, And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi, and the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now she did that because there was a decree that came out that every male child was to be killed. But she said, not my son, not my child. And so she took and she hid him for three months. And verse 3 tells us, uh, and when she could no longer hide him, uh, she took for him an ark of bulrushes uh, and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. Uh, and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. Uh, and his sister stood afar off to wit uh, what would be done to him. So here we have. This decree that's gone out, and, and, and this child is not supposed to live, and, and this, this child's life is supposed to be taken. Uh, but this mother looks at this precious gift from God, uh, and she looks there uh, at this child that she had conceived, that she had born, uh, and, and she saw that he was a goodly child. Uh, and it says she's looking here, uh, and she said, there's no way that I'm going to let them take my child. So she took, uh, and she hid that child for three months. Uh, and why did she hide that child for three months? Uh, she said because this is a goodly child and we all think that our kids are good we're not always right you watch the news on a guy who shot three cops and wiped out four people and his mom gets on the news and says he's a good boy we all think that our kids are good that's not always the case 
But Moses' mom looked upon that child. Uh, did, did she foresee what, uh, how God would use him? Uh, could she see into the future uh, of what God was going to do? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think she had a prophetic vision of what was going to come. Uh, but she just knew that there was an urgency uh, to say this was the gift that God gave me. Uh, and they're not going to kill my child. I'm going to protect my child. Uh, she did everything she could uh, to keep that child safe. And she did well for three months. But after about three months, the baby get, begins to get a little more rambunctious. And this child began to get maybe a little more rambunctious, and maybe she couldn't hide the cries and the, the pleas of the child any longer. And so she had a choice to make. She said, this is a good child. This was her bread. This was her gift. This was her, her promise from God, that that God had blessed her with, that that God had given her, uh, that God had uh, blessed her with this child. Uh, and now she had a hard decision to make uh, to say, I can no longer hide him. I can no longer protect him. I can no longer give him the protection that he needs. Uh, so she had to make a choice. Uh, and we read here uh, in verse 3, it said, when she could no longer hide him, she took that ark of bulrush and dabbed it with slime and, and with pitch and she put the child therein uh, and she set the flags upon the river brink. What did our text say? Cast thy bread upon the waters. Uh, she took that child just as Solomon was speaking about later uh, and she released uh, him out there upon that waters. Uh, did she know what was going to become of him? Did she know where he would end up? Uh, did she know where he would go? Uh, no, she was really taking a chance here uh, to cast and put Moses uh, there upon the waters and let the, the current take him where it will. And the sister watched, it says in verse 4. The sister was watching to see where her brother would end up. It says she stood afar off to wit what would be done of him. And here's the handiwork of God in verse 5. Moses' mother did all that she knew to do, and the hardest thing was to release that child. How many of you moms this morning think you could release that basket? How, how many times do you think maybe Sister Mary, she pulled it back to her and said, I, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's another way, Brother Underwood, that we can do this and that maybe she released it. I, I, I would think just the mindset of a parent, maybe that baby went a little ways and maybe she waited out there and pulled it back and said, wait, wait, wait. I don't know. She might have had a lot more trust and faith than what I do. But she took and she released that child. And when she did and when she took her hands off, and that baby began to float down that water. That began to float. She just had to trust that this is the divine plan of God. Oh, she didn't want to let him go. Oh, she didn't want to release him, but she didn't want him to die. She didn't want him to face the consequences of that system. Uh, so the, the baby sister said, i got to watch and see this. Uh, and to understand something, uh, when you cast your bread upon the waters, there's others going to watch and see what God is going to do with it. Uh, when you take that leap of faith, uh, there's going to be a next generation uh, that's looking to see uh, what will God do when they put faith to action. Uh, what will God do when they trust in Him? Uh, and so this this next generation she's watching uh, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself in the river uh, in verse 5 and her maidens walked along by the riverside uh, and when she saw the ark among the flags uh, she sent her maid to fetch it and when she had opened it she saw the child and behold the babe wept and she had compassion on him and said this is one of the Hebrews children and then, verse 7, then said the sister of Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went. I love this. Called the child's mother. We don't know how much space of time that Moses floated there before he floated up into Pharaoh's daughter's bath. But he come floating up there, and she saw him, and she fell in love with him. Why? Because he was a goodly child. To see him was to love him, and she looked there, uh, and as that baby wept, her heart was moved with compassion, uh, and, and mom had just released the child uh, to say, whatever will be, will be. Uh, and so sister saw this, and she runs, and she says to her, uh, uh, "There's uh, you want me to get one of the Hebrew women uh, that may nurse the child for thee? Uh, and obviously there was plenty of Hebrew women who could nurse the 
child uh, because their children had been killed and they, they had been taken from them. Uh, but there was only one that this child knew of. Uh, and she ran and it said she called the child's mother. Uh, in verse 9 it says, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Get this, uh, take this child away uh, and nurse it for me, uh, and I will give thee thy wages. Uh, and the woman took the child and nursed it. Now, a beautiful thing for Moses' mother was to have the child. But in having that child, she had to hide the child. She had to act like there was no child in the house. She had to keep the child quiet, to keep it silent. And it got to a place after three months that she could not do that anymore. Uh, the stress and the struggle that she was going through on a daily basis uh, just to keep Moses alive, just to keep her child alive. Uh, and, and so she knew it was time. I, I, I've just got to put him on the water uh, and let what happens, happens. Uh, where, where She didn't know where he would float and how far he would have to go uh, before he was found uh, and before provision was made. Uh, but he didn't have to float very far uh, before God made a way. Uh, and and when God made a way, uh, that child Moses was brought back. Uh, the mom that just released him, uh, she was ready to release him for not just the season, uh, but for the rest of her life if need be. Uh, why? Because it was more important to her uh, that Moses had a future. Uh, it was more important to her uh, that Moses would go forth. Uh, so she released him. She let him go. Uh, and she placed him there on the waters just uh, for the purpose of God to direct him uh, and let him float of all the places uh, that he could have floated floated to. I think I'd have floated up underneath a tree somewhere and got stuck. But not Moses. Moses flowed right up to Pharaoh's daughter, right there in her presence. And to know that he was directed. I believe that God directed the current that brought him there. Why? Because God says you're letting him go, but I'm bringing him back better than before because when he comes back to you you're not going to have to hide him. When he comes back to you, you can let him cry. When he comes back Back to you. Uh, he's coming back with provision. Uh, Moses' mother's trying to figure out how am I going to take care of this child? How am I going to keep him quiet? Uh, how am I going to be able to provide for him? Uh, but when he comes back, he comes back uh, not just her baby boy uh, but with all the provisions of the kingdom. With all the provisions of the kingdom. Everything that you need. Uh, she got paid to raise her own child. And said, here, nurse him. Take care of him. Raise him up. And so she did that. So when she was willing to let go of that child, God brought him back better than ever. Made a better situation out of it. And listen, that's a good story. That's a wonderful thing uh, for Moses' mother. But listen, uh, it gets better than that. Uh, she raised him up. You read over in Hebrews, uh, uh, in the faith chapter, it said Moses, when he come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, he, he's not, uh, I'm not that one I floated up to, uh, but I'm that one that nursed me. I'm that one that brought me in. Uh, I'm of that one that took care of me and that provided for me. Uh, and, and Brother Elijah preached on that thought uh, here last week at the youth service. Uh, he said mom was taking full advantage of the opportunity that she had with Moses uh, to teach her, him the ways of the Hebrews and to instill within him, uh, you're not one of them, you're not one of those, this is who you are. Uh, and, and so that began to, to begin to develop in his heart uh, and to know that he was not dead, uh, that he was not one of those children that was slain. Uh, he was one that his life was to be taken but his life was not to, uh, taken uh, but his life was saved and spared for a purpose and she received him back with better provision that's wonderful but the story goes on in Exodus 3 chapter 7 or verse 7 excuse me the Lord said I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and I've heard the cry by reason of their taskmasters for I know their sorrows Moses at, at this point was grown he grew up, he saw an Egyptian slay a Hebrew, and he responded to that. And he killed that Egyptian, and now he's going to be uncovered, and he becomes a vagabond. He comes, he leaves, and he flees from that place, running for his life. And now he's on the backside of the wilderness, and he's, he's there, and he's in this place, and it says that another Pharaoh had rose up. Things had changed. He'd been gone for a long time. He'd left that place. He left there running for his life. He left there running scared. He left there not knowing what to do. He left there uh, not knowing.
what his life would become. Uh, but as soon as he got to uh, that place that he was at, God began to make provisions. Uh, it was in that place that he met uh, his wife. Uh, it was in that place that he came in contact with a father-in-law that instilled within him. Uh, that He was in that place. Uh, but in that place, God said, I didn't uh, bring you out to bring you into that place. Uh, but he said, I brought you out to bring you back. I brought you out to bring you back. So here he was, and he's saying, and the Lord said, I've surely seen the affliction. And God saw the affliction. He said, I've come down, in verse 8, to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good and a large and a land flowing with milk and honey unto a place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Parasites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Verse 9, he said, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. And that's where he spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And he told Moses, Go and deliver my people. And that, that's a message within itself. But Moses comes back, uh, and he comes back in power and authority. Uh, and, and those of us who've studied the Word of God knows that he took uh, and he led the people out of Egyptian bondage, millions that he led there out of Egyptian bondage. This was a child that was supposed to be killed. Uh, this was a child who was not supposed to be spared. Uh, but because mom took that faith and put it to work, uh, and when she had hit him as long as she could hide him, uh, she released him out upon the waters. Uh, remember our text, cast thy bread upon the waters. Uh, it was not somebody else's child it was her own child it was not somebody else's heart it was her own heart it was not somebody else's seed it was her own seed listen you can't get the same results when you put somebody else's faith to action when you send somebody else and when you put somebody else out there but you have to know that it's your own she said this is my own this was one conceived to me this is my responsibility that she placed him there upon the waters because of the faith of that mother God used that child in a mighty way he raised him up to be uh, one of the greatest men of God to ever walk the face of the earth, uh, to be a deliverer to the people, uh, that God set that in place. Uh, and so what that mother did not realize there that day uh, when she released him, uh, she said, I've got to let him go. Uh, but as she let him go, uh, when she cast her bread upon the water, uh, what she did not realize in that moment, uh, and what you will not always realize in that moment, uh, that God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way. To understand that you don't know uh, why God is asking you to step and to move in that direction. Uh, but understand that Moses' mother, if she could share with us this morning, uh, she'll tell you, go ahead and cast it upon the waters. Uh, go ahead and give it. Uh, go ahead and put it on the water. Uh, go ahead and trust it on the waters. Uh, it's not going to sink. Uh, it's not going to be over. Uh, it's not the end of the line. Uh, but to understand God's telling somebody this morning, uh, this isn't the end. This is the beginning. Uh, let go and let God uh, and see what I'll do with it so she released him but little did she know that he would come back as one that would deliver millions deliver millions he came back better than ever okay that excited two or three of you let's try Elisha let's try Elisha first Kings chapter 19 beginning in verse 19 this is talking about Elijah now this is always a tough message tough two to preach on Elijah and Elisha guarantee you at some point you're going to mix them up but here they are and found Elisha the son of Shaphath who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him and he with the 12 and Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him and he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said let me I pray thee kiss my father and my mother and then we'll follow thee and he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him, and get this, and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Elisha is minding his own business, plowing his field uh, with his yoke of oxen, uh, and he's just carrying on. Uh, the man of God comes through town. His mantle brushes over him. Uh, but you have to understand uh, how, how this story came about. Uh, before this happened, uh, God saw Elisha in the field. 
God saw where he was at and what he was doing uh, because remember, if you remember, uh, when, when you read back uh, just a little ways uh, before this, we find Elijah's on the top of the mountain calling fire down from heaven. How many remember reading that? He calls fire down from heaven and Baal's prophets are slain uh, and a great victory is wrought. But the next day he gets a letter from Jezebel. And she said, I'm going to take your life. And he ran, and he ran and hid himself in the wilderness in a cave. And while he was in that cave, uh, the Lord drawed him out of that cave and said, What are you doing here? Uh, and began to speak to him. Uh, and in this counter of, encounter of speaking to him, uh, he says this to him. He said, uh, There's purpose for you. There's still a work for you to be done. And that work, uh, basically what the Lord was saying, you can't do what I've called you to do by hiding out in a cave. Uh, get out of the cave. Uh, and one of the things that he told him uh, was on his agenda to do, uh, upcoming things. Uh, the Lord went ahead and shared his Google calendar with Elijah and said, listen, this is what's on your calendar of events to do. Upcoming events, Elijah, is to anoint Elisha as your successor. God had a plan. Here's Elisha. He don't know anything about what's going on in that conversation over wherever they're at. He's just plowing in his field, and he is just doing the work that he's called to do and just taking care of business as always. And here comes Elijah on a mission from God. I'm not hiding in a cave anymore. I've heard from God, and he comes through town. And when he comes through town, he sees Elijah, and he takes that mantle. That mantle represents the anointing. And that anointing upon the man of God's life touches Elijah's life, uh, he stops dead in his tracks. Uh, he says, hold on, let me go back and kiss mom and dad goodbye. Elijah said, what are you talking about? Uh, he said, I've got to follow after him. Uh, and so he went back and kissed mom and dad. Uh, but look what he did. He said, this is going to be the point of no return. Uh, he took that yoke and he burned it uh, and he boiled those oxen. He said, y'all eat of it. Uh, I'm not going to need that anymore. Uh, he didn't know where he was going. Uh, he didn't know where he was going to go. Uh, but he said, I'm casting my bread upon the water. Uh, I'm giving up the yoke. I'm giving up the oxen. I, I felt the anointing. I, I felt the calling. I felt the purpose. I, and I know that I'm supposed to follow Elijah. So wherever Elijah goes, I go. Uh, so now here's Elijah following Elijah everywhere he goes. Sister Mary's preached it. Brother Elijah has come and preached it. I have preached it. So I don't know if you need the visual or not. But everywhere Elijah went, Elijah was right behind him. Everywhere he went. It seems to me sometimes, Brother Underwood, as I read it, maybe I'm reading too much into it, Elijah's getting frustrated. Why are you following me everywhere? He said, I don't know, but I know I'm supposed to follow you. All I know is where you go, I'm going. He said, listen, son, this would be a good place for you to stay. Just stay right here. I ain't staying right there. I didn't burn my oxen. I didn't boil my oxen and burn my yoke to stay here. I didn't lay it all down. I didn't cast it all on the waters. I didn't put it all on the line to settle for here. I, I did not come uh, this far just to settle here. Uh, there's times that we can do that, and sometimes uh, the challenge may be come from the pulpit. Uh, say, this is a good place that we're in right now. Uh, let's just stay right here. Uh, he said, you can just stay right here, uh, but I've got to go a little bit further. He said, well, if you're going a little bit further, uh, I'm going a little bit further. Uh, he said, if you're going a little further, uh, I'm going to, well, come on, son, let's go. Uh, and so they went a little bit further, uh, and this went on and on and on. Uh, and so in 2 Kings 2, in verse 6 it says Elijah said unto him Terry I pray thee here for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan and he said as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth I will not leave thee and the two went on what more is there to be said when somebody's got that determination, uh, he said, come on, let's go. The two went on. They came to that Jordan. They had come to several places. Uh, but here's Elijah. Why did he keep going, Sister Gilda? Because he already boiled the oxen. He already burnt the yoke. He already kissed mom and daddy goodbye. He said, I have put my own self on the line. I've stepped out. There's some that have stepped out, and they're looking back. Remember Lot's wife. No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Elijah stepped out and he said, I'm going all the way. It's not going to do you any good to step out if you're not willing to go all the way. 
is what Elijah would preach to us this week. And all along those stops, there was these guys called the 50 Sons of the Prophets. They were the local Bible college, if you remember. And they kept telling Elijah, Elijah, I just want you to know, Elijah's going to be taken from you. Elijah's not always going to be there. He's going to be taken. Yes, I know, he said. Hold your peace. Hold your peace. He said, I know all of these things. I understand very clear what is coming of this. But I understand very clear what I've got to do. He said in verse 7, and here they are again, 50 men, the sons of the prophets. He's getting ready to cross over Jordan. Stood to view afar off. And they stood by Jordan. Remember when Moses' mother placed him there? sister was standing off watching from a distance always somebody watching 50 sons of the prophet are now watching look at Elijah he's going and it's not a matter of him going it's a matter of how he's going to come back he's going with Elijah and Elijah we know Elijah Elijah's full of power and full of anointing uh, he's got the mantle of God uh, 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 Baal's prophets were slain uh, he, he's, prove, he's got a proven track record of being a man of God uh, but I don't know what this kid Elijah's doing uh, he was just out in the field uh, working with his oxen uh, I, I don't know who he thinks he is uh, but he's following Elijah everywhere he goes uh, matter of fact even after Elijah's gone his reputation was this he who washed Elijah's hands that was his claim to fame. But it did not matter to him about a title. It did not matter to him about anybody's opinion. It did not matter about what the 50 sons of the prophets who were well more studied and well more versed in what was going on in him. What mattered to him is he said, I've got some bread that God told me to cast upon the waters. I've got a part of me that God told me to cast upon the water. That God told me to put it in the fight, if you will. That God told me uh, to put it, lay it all on the line. That God told me uh, just to go out there and do it. Uh, they're looking at him, and they're wondering what's going to happen. Uh, and so they're viewing, and they're watching. Uh, listen, uh, I don't want to be the spectator uh, that's watching to see what God's going to do in somebody else's life. Uh, I have no desire uh, to be one of the 50 sons of the prophets standing over there from Bible school uh, looking to see what God's going to do uh, in somebody's life that's willing to give all I'd rather be that Elijah to say man of God where you go I go where the anointing's at is where I want to be at it could have been any of those 50 men following Elijah but it was not it was Elijah why because they were too busy being spectators they were too busy being naysayers and Elijah said hold your peace I don't care what man has to say I want to know what God is going to do with this because I've cast my bread upon the waters and so they're watching Elijah did what Elijah does. Took that mantle, wrapped it together, smote the waters. They were divided hither and thither, so they too went over on dry ground. It came to pass when they were gone over, Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elijah said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Elijah opened the waters. They went across, and obviously those waters went back together. And now the 50 sons of the prophet's view are skewed. They can't see what's going on on the other side. When you go all the way, they can't see what's going on on the other side. When you step into the presence of God, when you step right into God's divine will, those onlookers are trying to peek over, trying to see, trying to look. What's going on over there? I can picture them, Sister Mary, maybe standing on each other's shoulders trying to see over on the other side. They didn't have binoculars back then, I don't guess. But they wondered, what is going on? I don't want to be that one standing on the outside uh, wondering what's going on with somebody who's willing to go all the way. Uh, but I'd much rather be that one that goes all the way. Cast thy bread upon the waters. Trust it to the waters. Uh, trust God. Uh, it may take a mountain. It may take a valley. It may take a desert. Uh, it may take all of the, it may take burning the oxen, uh, it may, boiling the oxen. And it may take uh, burning the yoke. Uh, it may take all of those things. Uh, but what he says, do, do. Uh, and that's what Elijah did. He had went all the way. Uh, and now it's just him and Elijah, him and the man of God standing there. The naysayers are on the other side of Jordan. They weren't willing to go that far, couldn't go that far. He said, what is it? Why have you followed me this far? Why have you come this far? Listen, Elijah knew that God told him to anoint Elijah. That's something you've got to understand about this story. Elijah knew full well 
what the purpose was, but it was also his obligation and his position uh, to make sure that Elijah was positioned uh, where he needed to be before he did what God told him to do. And he had to be willing to go all the way. Each time he told him to stay here, you think he really wanted him to stay there? No. He wanted to see if he's willing to go. He said, this would be a good place. You could stay here. Stay here. i got to go further. If somebody could tell you, stay here, this is a good place, and you stay, it's not going to work. You've got to be willing to go all the way. And he was. And here he is. He's standing there. He said in verse 9, it came to pass. He had made his request. He said, I want a double portion of that spirit that's on you. It came to pass when they were going over that Elijah said unto Elijah, Ask what I do thee before I be taken. He said, Let that spirit double portion be upon me. In verse 10, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and part of them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. That's good, isn't it? This is better. Elijah saw it. And Elijah saw it. Why is that better? He said, because if you see me when I'm taken, uh, it shall be done. Uh, So when we read there in verse 12, uh, and Elijah saw it, you know what that's saying in essence? Uh, Request granted. Oh, if you get a hold of that this morning. What it was saying there, we read, and Elijah saw it. uh, But what the Spirit is saying, uh, request was granted. uh, It was just what he asked for. uh, And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. uh, And he saw him no more. uh, And listen, he took hold of his own clothes uh, and rent them uh, in two pieces. uh, But understand something, as Elijah went up, the mantle came down. The man of God was taken up. But the anointing was not needed in heaven. The anointing is needed upon earth. Elijah had no need of the man or where he was going. You would later see him in the New Testament on the Mount of Configuration uh, with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. You see them standing there. uh, But he was not going to need the mantle, uh, but Elijah was going to need the mantle. uh, And so that mantle comes down, uh, and he took up, verse 13, uh, and he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. I get visual when I read Scripture. And I'm I'm thinking of this picture of that mantle, whatever it looked like, flowing down. And Elijah's got it in his hand. Just a few days before, he had yoke up oxen in his hand, plowing a field, sweat on his brow. No doubt, Elijah was told, you're going to anoint Elijah. And so you can't tell me any other way. Sister Baltman says, preach it any way you want to when you preach it. But I just know how God dealt with me when he was calling me. And it wasn't just out of nowhere, out of the blue, that anointing touched my life. But before that anointing ever touched my life, before an anointed preacher ever came into my life, God was dealing with my heart. I can imagine Elijah there fighting back tears of God telling him, Son, you're going to have to give all. You're going to have to lay it all on the line. You're going to have to give it yourself to me. And I believe that that's just what unfolded uh, because as soon as that mantle touched him, he knew, that's what I've been waiting for. That's what I've been waiting for. When that anointing touched his life, uh, he got there and he went all the way. uh, And he said, now here I am. I've followed Elijah all this way. Uh, I've come away from my family. Uh, I've left everything. Uh, He's crossed Jordan. The 50 sons of the prophet are on the other side. Uh, All the naysayers are on the other side. All the skeptics are on the other side. Uh, Mom and dad's on the other side. Home is on the other side. Uh, Everything else is on that side of Jordan. Uh, And he said, God didn't call me here uh, to leave me here. Listen, Sister uh, Mary talked about this morning about stepping into the presence of the Lord. Uh, God has called us into His presence, uh, and He's called us into a place that He can anoint us, uh, and He can feel us, and He can fuel us. uh, But that's not, uh, it wasn't for the goosebump. It wasn't for the feel good. uh, It wasn't just to feel the experience. uh, It wasn't for the wow moment. uh, It wasn't for the God moment. uh, It wasn't for that, my, my, what a service we had today. Uh, Listen, those encounters with God uh, are for a purpose, uh, and now 
he's holding the mantle in his hand. He said, oh, I would love to stay here. I don't know about you, but I've been in those pleasant moments of the Lord being a church service or a prayer closet. I say, Lord, I just want to stay right here because I feel your presence. Man, he had that anointing in his hand. He had that power of God. It came from the man of God, that double portion that he had prayed for and that he had asked for. It was there in his hands. And listen, there's no place that I'd rather be. There's no place. But he said, Elijah feels this urgency in his heart. Son, you can't stay here. I didn't bring you this far for you to stay here, but you got to go back. So he stands there at the brink of the Jordan getting a little more excited about Elijah than you did Moses. He took also the mantle of Elijah and fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Don't think for a moment that's a disrespectful question that he's asking. But he's just wanting to know. We know request granted, but he still wasn't quite certain yet. Was my request granted? And he takes and he smokes the waters. It says, and when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elijah went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. He didn't come running across the water. The waters parted. And when the waters parted, he didn't come running through the parted water saying, I got it, I got it. Praise God, I got it. He didn't come shouting and screaming and hollering and saying, listen here, boys, there's a new sheriff in town. Elijah's gone, but Elijah's here. And I've got a double portion of what he had. We don't read any of that, do we? Uh, but they looked and they saw. Uh, they said, man, Elijah went. He went all the way. Uh, he crossed the Jordan. The waters were parted. Uh, we don't know what happened over there. Uh, but all we know uh, is he came back. He went. Uh, he was following the anointing. Uh, but when he came back, uh, the anointing was upon him. Uh, when he went, uh, he was following after the will of God. Uh, when he came back, uh, he was walking in the will of God. Uh, listen, if you're willing to lay it all on the line uh, and cast it all upon the waters uh, and trust it unto the master uh, and to know something it's going to be returned uh, unto you better than ever before. Uh, Elijah you can study it out and Elijah did twice as many miracles as Elijah did. Twice as many. No more, no less. Exactly what he prayed for. Why? Because he was willing to go all the way and can I tell you if you're willing even when you don't understand willing to cast it upon the waters give your life completely to God you're going to come back better than ever Moses did Elijah did he couldn't get excited about Moses he couldn't get excited about Elijah if you're a Christian you've got to get excited about Jesus Luke 23 verse 45 and 46 tells us this is the end of Jesus life here on earth all the miracles and all the things that he had done, and all the great things that have seen, and now he's been taken to be crucified. They chose Barabbas over Jesus. He could have been released, but they said, give us Barabbas. And now this awful scene has unfolded that we know is crucifixion day. We celebrate resurrection day, but there would have never been a resurrection day without a crucifixion day. And so here he was, it says in verse 45 of Luke 23, and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said, said thus, he gave up the ghost. What is that saying? Jesus died. Jesus died. Goes, the story goes on. Joseph, Nicodemus, they go and claim the body of Jesus. They take great care of his body. They take him off that cross. They place him in Joseph's tomb. After they wrapped him in a clean linen cloth and did all of that that they needed to do to prepare him. They did it with urgency, of course, because they understood the urgency of the time. And they placed him there, that tomb. 
A stone was rolled to the door. Guards were placed there on that tomb. They thought he was gone. They thought it was over. Peter said, I'm going fishing. The one that Jesus said, lay down your nets and I'll make you fishers of men. He said, I'm going fishing. All the others had already turned away. Peter was the only one that had followed him all the way, and he followed him afar off. John chapter 6, verse 66 tells us that even before this day came, when he began to talk about his blood and his flesh, he said, this dude's weird. And they walked away and followed him no more. So he had lost his followers. Now he's laying in a grave, and as he's laying there in that grave, they think he's gone. Their hearts are broken. These women are gathering there at his tomb, and they're thinking he's gone. He worked miracles. They knew what he did. They knew the power that was in it. They said he's dead. Day one passed. Day two passed. He's dead. But while they thought he was dead, he wasn't in the grave. He was, scripture tells us that he was getting a hold of the keys. The keys to what? To death, hell, and the grave. Now, I've heard many preachers preach it different ways. Uh, some have said that Jesus came and he kicked in the door of hell uh, and said to Satan, give me the keys. I don't think it took all that. I think Satan knew his voice. I think all of hell was rejoicing that Jesus was dead. Uh, there was an uneasy feeling uh, in, in Satan's mind uh, that, no, he's up to something. God's always up to something. Uh, and they're there, and they're celebrating this great victory, and all the imps uh, possibly rejoicing over this great victory. Uh, and then there's this voice that uh, old Satan hears. Uh, see, he calls him by a name that's familiar to him. He says, Lucifer. Lucifer, he knew what he was there for. Listen, even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when they thought he was dead, he's working. They thought he's dead. They thought he's done. They thought he's finished. Uh, they thought it was complete. Uh, but we don't celebrate a dead God today, do we? Uh, we celebrate a risen Savior. Uh, that they don't understand that when they came uh, to that grave to where he was supposed to be laid, uh, that the, it tells us uh, that the, the earth shook and that rock uh, was there. Uh, and it said there that they began, the graves began to burst open. Uh, and as that began to happen, they began to look at this scene. Uh, and, and as he had already he said, I commend my spirit unto you. Uh, but listen, uh, what scripture tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So how could that be if he was dead in a grave? How could that be when they say, you seek Jesus? He's not here. He is risen. He is not here. He was not in that grave. He was taking the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And then they watched as he ascended. He appeared to them, uh, and he went to heaven. Uh, and some say he's not coming back. Uh, some still looking for him the first time. Uh, but Paul writes there, he said, he's coming back. Uh, and he's coming back in power. Uh, how do you know that? Because in John chapter 14, he, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. Uh, that where I may am, there you may be also. Uh, listen, I don't know if it's even possible, uh, but Jesus is gone. He's at the right hand of the Father. Uh, but can I tell you? He's coming back. And when he's coming back, he's coming back better than ever. I still believe that. I still believe in the rapture of the church. I still believe in the second coming of the Lord. And I believe that he is coming back. Moses came back better than ever. Elijah came back better than ever. Jesus arose from that grave with the keys to death, hell, and the grave better than ever. He's gone to be at the right hand of the Father. But he is coming back. And it's going to be better than ever. But can I tell you this morning... If you're willing uh, to cast your bread upon the waters uh, and trust God, uh, you're going to come. You're not going to sink. Uh, you're not going to go down in despair. Uh, it's not the end. It's the beginning. Uh, you're going to come back better than ever. Full of anointing. Full of power. Luke 6, 38 says, Give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. 
for with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. And no, I'm not taking up an offering this morning. But I'm telling you that what Jesus said here not only applies to money, but it applies to every aspect of your life. Give. Give of yourself freely unto the cause of God. How many is willing to take of their own and cast it upon the Lord? What are you talking about? I'm talking about laying it on the line. Talking about going back to the time of Ezekiel when he said, go a little bit deeper. This is the will of God for your life. To, to let it flow out there a little bit deeper. Listen, God in all of his providence will recompense it back to you. God's going to give it back to him. Uh, you've lent it to him. You've given it to him. Uh, and he is not unrighteous to forget it. Uh, he's not slack concerning his promises. Uh, but he is going to pay it again to you. There's nothing that you can do in the work of the Lord uh, that God is not going to take care of it. Uh, scripture tells us, Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And who? He shall exalt you in due time. So what is our part? Cast it upon the waters. Step out. Put it out there. Lay it on the line. Let go of it. Cut the strings. Pull up the anchor. God talking to somebody this morning. I don't know how many more renditions of that that I can give you. Let go. Give it to God. Surrender. Submit. Commit thy ways unto the Lord. I am thine, O Lord. I surrender. I give you my all. Throughout the word of God, we find it over and over again. But here we are, right? Oh, I could go, but hang on, I'm anchored down. Or maybe we got a little bit of a string and we go a little bit further. Why? Because we only want to go so far. Some of you have gone a little ways. And you, see, that feels good. We get into revival service and we go out there. Man, we get out here and say, oh, wait, I can't swim. We realize I can't swim. I can't make it. It's not about you. It's about trusting. You're not going to sink. You're not going to sink. God's told somebody to step out and you said, there's no way I can step out. I'm going to sink. Maybe you told more than one because you got real quiet. I can't do that, God. I'm not Moses. I'm not Elijah. And I sure enough ain't Jesus. I can't cast it on the waters. I can't give like that. I, I'm just not made up of that. Moses had excuses too, didn't he? I'm slow of speech. I'm slow of speech. Elijah said, I got some things that I got to take care of before I can step out. Right? And Jesus had those that he was God in the flesh. And they quit following him. So whatever excuse is popping up in your mind this morning saying, Pastor's telling me to step out. I can't step out because of this. I can't cast my bread upon the water. I can't. I have nothing to give. I, I'm just a nobody. <laughs> Isn't that what they sung last week? Sister Mary called us a bunch of misfits. Here a few months ago, I had I was talking about that, and Sister Amy Talbot put it up on the screen. The island of misfit toys. So I'm just a misfit. God can use this one. God can use Brian McDonald, and God can use Eddie Sullivan, and God can use Brother Hanks, and God can use Pastor Jamie, and God can use that. But I'm not them. You can be. Elijah was not an Elijah when he was there with his yoke of oxen. But you know what made the difference? The anointing. And when the anointing touches your life, it's not going to be a message that I preach on Sunday morning that causes you to step out. It's not going to be any words that come out of my mouth, but it's going to be the anointing that touches your life. It says, I'm releasing it. I'm giving it to God. And I know, understand something, it's not going to sink. It's not going to sink. Hebrews 6 and 10. Sister Gilda, if you'll come and help me, I'm going to close. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work 
and labor of love, which you have shewed towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Reminding us, it's not in vain. Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, is what it says in another place. Your labor is not in vain. Why would we sit back and hold on to it? It could be monetary. It could be monetary that God's told you to invest in the ministry. Oh, I better have this. You got to buy me a cheeseburger at the church. Or maybe it's bigger than that. I've got plans for this. I've got an investment. I'm investing in the future of my children. I'm investing in the future of my family. I've got to hold on to this. My nest egg. If we begin to say, I got plans. Moving on from money. I've got plans for my life. It's what I want to be. It's what I want to do. Every time I watch a cop show, I remember my plans that I had for my life. I want to be a detective at this point in my life. That wasn't God's plan. It wasn't God's purpose. But I had plans, I had ambitions, I had dreams. I began to do the research, the academy, and all of those things that I wanted to do with my life. But one day, 16 years old, up underneath the tent, the tent crusade, Lane Avenue Church of God, a place that I later served as youth pastor. God in all of his mercy and the way he does things. Standing there, I could take you about to the place that I was standing in that field, 16 years old, when God called me to step out and preach my word. Not me, John. Not me. I can't. The excuses were flowing there, Sister Debbie. I, I was telling God all the reasons I can't preach the gospel. You know what he said to me, Sister Pam? Preach my gospel. Preach my word. Sister Ron, I said, you got the wrong guy. I'm nudging the guy next to me. Listen, God's talking to you. Preach my word. I have my own, myself, my bread in my hand. And that was that moment that I had to decide, what am I going to do with my bread? What am I going to do with what is mine? given to me that I possess am I going to hold it tight and say nope can't do that no thanks appreciate the offer am I going to cast it upon the Lord I didn't have literal bread in my hand there was no water up underneath that tent but in the spiritual realm God said it preach my word and my response went from no Lord can't do that I'm going to hold on to what I'm gonna, I've got these plans. This is what I was planning to do. No, when I said this, okay, God, I'll preach. I'll preach your word. What was that? That was me casting my bread upon the wall. And I'm telling you, maybe in weak faith, I'm saying, I'm going to sink. I'm going to fall flat on my face. Nobody's going to come and hear me. Nobody's going to want to hear me. Even over the next couple years of stepping out into that, stepping into that pulpit, first sermon, three minutes. Oh, you wish I was still there, don't you? Just standing up there. And man, I, I missed it. But here I'm floating on the water. Feeling at times I'm going to sink. I missed it. This ain't it. But I knew my heart, my faith knew no, you're not going to sink you're not going to sink it's coming back it's coming back better than ever are you willing to be like Moses to be like Elijah, to be like Jesus and you could just go through the Bible and find one after another who is willing to cast their bread upon the water to give of yourself completely we talked about submission over the last few weeks and really we're still talking about it this morning total submitting letting go letting God 
Quit with the excuses. Quit with the naysayers. Quit with the I cannot. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. You wonder why you're in a desert? Why you're on a mountain? Why you're in the midst of troubled sea? I can't sing it as pretty as they did, but sometimes it takes a mountain. Sometimes a troubled sea. Sometimes a desert. Why? Because God's trying to get a hold of your heart and say, Give me all. Lord, I give you this. Lord, I give you that. Lord, I'll, I'll come to church on Sunday. God said, no, give me you. Give me you. Place yourself upon this altar this morning and say, Lord, here I am. Many are called, but few are chosen. So this message is for everybody this morning, but not everybody is going to receive it. But the ones that choose to receive it are going to be the chosen. The ones that step out and say, that's for me. That's what I need to do. And, and when Sister Mary, I feel like God is really trying to speak to somebody this morning. I tell you, trust me. Trust me and believe. Cast your bread upon the waters. It's going to return. It's going to be better than it ever was before. Do you believe that this morning? Stand with me today. Father God, help us to be willing to give you our all. Totally committed. Holding nothing back. Having no reserve. Not saying, well, I'll follow God, but i got a backup plan. I'm going to trust God, but I've got some reserve over here just in case it don't work. We either trust you or we don't. Lord, you're looking for some folks this morning to be willing to cast the bread upon the waters. Their own. Giving of themselves. Giving from within themselves. Giving of themselves. Giving their all. You're looking for some that will fall across this altar this morning and say, Lord, I'm casting all of my cares upon you because I know you care for me. And I know that you're in control. Father, I just ask you right now, touch hearts and lives, minds and souls in this altar. We ask it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Who will step out this morning? And you're stepping out, you're saying, I'm casting my bread upon the waters. Casting it all upon the waters. And understand that God will return it. He will return it in power. He will return it anointed. He will return it for His glory. I'm coming in a man after my own desire, but I'm coming back a man after God's own heart. Going in as a woman who's got my mind preoccupied with so many things of life, but I'm coming back a woman focused on the purpose and the plan of God. Coming in about me, but I'm coming back about the kingdom. Who's ready to come back better than ever? Feel these altars this morning. Thank you, Jesus.